A.M. Jay Shankar is uh, speaking to A.N.I. at the moment. Let us cut across to his interview. Speaking with A.N.I., wish you a very happy New Year. Yeah, same to you and to all your uh, viewers. Uh, and congratulations for the book, Why Bharat Matters. Uh, if I may say so, it's a very readable and uh, user-friendly book. Okay. Um, as uh, somebody who's done reporting on uh, foreign policy, many incidents that you mention in the book, one is seen at close quarters. And mm -hmm. you being a practitioner of foreign policy as a diplomat, as, as a politician now, um, you've seen the, it at very close quarters. Uh, so who did you really have in mind while writing the book? Because when I read it, I felt it's, it's anybody can get lessons from that, not just journalists, not just people in think tanks, but who did you have in mind? Well, if you got a sense that anybody could uh, use it, I think I then appear to have succeeded in what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the last uh, decade, uh, there have been enormous changes. There have been enormous changes in the country, mm. but especially in foreign policy, with which I have personally been involved. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, I've really, at the beginning of the book, tried to uh, explain why I wrote the book, which is, unless a person who is themselves involved in the process of change starts narrating the story and explaining it, people do not necessarily understand it. Mm. Now. When I say people, I actually mean the general public. Yeah. Uh, because one of my points I make is foreign policy is important for everybody today. It's not something which people in South Block or, you know, or even I would say the, uh, the larger uh, political class or, or the people involved in diplomacy have stakes in. You know, I've tried to bring out how the, uh, the, av you know, the normal people, the average people uh, have sticks. Mm -hmm. But some of it is also because what has been happening in the world. I mean, if you look uh, at the last, even the last five years, I mean, we've had COVID, uh, we've had, uh, you know, Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban takeover, we've had problems on our border with China. Uh, we've but had, in the uh, book, you don't just mention it as, uh, okay, we've had these problems. I like how it becomes relevant to me as a layperson when you talk about Vande Bharat and how I as a lay person would be connected to foreign policy because of Vande Bharat or the, you know, the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, evacuation of yeah. uh, people, right. the Ganga, yes. uh, Operation Ganga, then you talk about several things, the COVID diplomacy. So it makes it, uh, you know, relatable when well, it comes to. No, absolutely. Because, you know, what I have tried to do is to say, okay, look, here is a big picture. And here is what people would normally say, you know, very complex diplomacy. Okay, there's a uh, MEA and a foreign service and a minister who handle and a government which handles all of this. I have tried to show, yes, we may be doing all that, but every one of these somewhere impacts your life. That if we take a stand, let us say, on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have done so because we are shielding the Indian consumer from unreasonable increases in the petrol price yeah. uh, at the pump. Or if uh, there is a COVID challenge, uh, we have mounted this massive mission, uh, Vande Bharat, uh, which actually you know brings back 7 million people. Yeah, like as a mother huh. who has a son or a daughter stuck in Ukraine, yeah, ex yeah. would have thought that uh, foreign policy doesn't really matter to till, me till, that, till that happened. No, and, and you know, and again, the point I make is, look, these are no longer going to be one-off situations. Yeah. That, you know, there's Ukraine, there is, mm -hmm. I mean, recently Operation Ajay in Israel, there's yeah. uh, uh, Operation Kaveri uh, in, uh, in Sudan. That because Indians are working abroad, because Indians are studying abroad, mm -hmm. because you and I and mm. hundreds, if not millions of families are also traveling abroad. Yeah. You know, people go as tourists. We, you know, if you look at merchant shipping today, look at air crew, look at the people working in hotels, people who have jobs, blue collar jobs abroad. So we are globalizing. We need to know what those big dangers are out there. Mm. Uh, and in a sense, that's why a lot of the I would say the examples and the metaphors I've used. Yeah. You know, the, the big dangers, sometimes all the players are not aware what it means to you, but at the end of the day, it means something to everybody personally. Correct. 
And uh, the other interesting thing that I liked in the book was the allegorical references and the metaphors that you drew from the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly when we read books about uh, foreign policy or statecraft or uh, national security, they derive their references and their metaphors from say the Mahabharat. Mm -hmm. But uh, I found it interesting that you found lessons on statecraft, diplomacy, everything from the Ramayana and that was very interesting because I mean things like uh, what Vibhishan did or Valivad, uh, that you know when it comes to statecraft you could draw from that epic was very interesting. Uh, why, yeah. why Ramayana? Well, uh, there's, there's both a logic and an incident. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the incident actually was uh, when I was preoccupied writing the book, uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I'd gone to give a talk about my previous book. Okay. And somebody actually asked me, my recollection is it's in, it was in Pune, uh, saying that, look, uh, you've uh, used Mahabharat, so, you know, have you ever thought about using uh, Ramayana as a, as a mm. context, uh, as, a, as a, something to draw from? Uh, and uh, it was there somewhere at the back of my mind, but I think that incident mm. uh, compelled me to look at it. But the other, there's another reason also. The other reason is, look, Ramayana, um, there's, there's a difference in era, mm. you know, uh, even in what are norms and standards. I mean, mm. by the time you reach Mahabharat, uh, it's absolute real politics. I mean, you know, uh, uh, whereas I think it's important today to remind people that a reputation also has a value, that uh, it, is, it is not something, you know, which is uh, hot air and, you know, it's not posturing, that mm. uh, standards mean something, rule of law means something, mm. norms do, uh, do, do count. So, but even those who have a higher purpose have to practice statecraft and those who practice statecraft must always remember the higher purpose. Mm. So, in a sense, you know, uh, I've tried to, in, in Rama and really also to bring out the, the uh, I, w I would say the, the ethical or the, you know, our striving at the end of the day for a better world. You know, not that we win any which way and mm -hmm. and take what we get. In the book, while reading the book, uh, it's a bit confusing. Am I reading a book written by an academician? Am I reading a book written by a diplomat turned politician? Or am I reading a book written by a politician turned academic once again? It's like a... I can't figure out, like, you know, when you read a book, you want to know what the author is, who the author is, why is he looking at this prism. So, what are you writing as? Uh, I think a mixture of all of them. You know, the, the diplomat uh, in me has, a, in a sense, you can say, the domain knowledge and the experience which I talk about. The politician in me feels the need to communicate that, to to, as we said, to the, to the everyday world, to mm. the normal, you know, uh, uh, to the Samanya Nagrik, you can say. And uh, in a sense, you know, look, if there are uh, perhaps two, uh, two sagas, two stories, if all of us have grown up with, this is really the Ramayana and Mahabharata, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, we often use so much of the uh, metaphors and the situations and the comparisons in our normal life. You sure. know, uh, you know, if I were to talk to you chatting, I may bring up some, some uh, reference there. So why I used that was also to remind people, look, we are a, you know, uh, multiple sort of uh, uh, millennia old civilization. When we discuss the world, you know, can we think about doing it on our terms and in our, you know, in our framework, in our construct. So there was that part of it also, you know, that uh, for me to, to think of the world, you know, I mean, as you can see, what I've tried to do is to take a particular theme and to try to, to uh, give it a Ramayan type relevance. Mm. So, so say, for example, uh, I've used the coalition building, you know, co how Lord Ram very carefully 
constructs a coalition and what it takes to construct a coalition you know mm -hmm. it doesn't happen by itself or even even you know in diplomacy uh, you, i mean uh, you've heard me say before that the two uh, preeminent examples of diplomats are uh, you know hanuman mm -hmm. and shri krishna but there are others you know angad for example or even his mother tara mm. uh, these are people who in very difficult situations practice their uh, diplomatic uh, skills so i like the vibhishan uh, part too you know the vibhishan part that was very interesting and i wanted uh, you to expound on that i wanted more details because many times we think of vibhishan as okay traitor mm -hmm. from one aspect sure, but sure. you said that there's more to it well i i you know I, there, there are two angles from which I've approached Vibhishan. One, of course, that Vibhishan itself, in a sense, is a person torn between uh, between a, uh, you know a commitment to to the right, you know, mm. to the to dharma on one side and and the uh, fact that he's from mm. uh, Lanka and mm. really, you know, he's Raman's brother. Uh, so that's that's the dilemma that he has. But I've also tried to put the other side. I mean, we always think of, when you say Vibhishan, uh, what is he? But mm -hmm. think of what must have been passing through uh, Ram's mind when Vibhishan turns up. So and is it then, ethically or morally right what he did? And then you bring it to, I don't want to be a spoiler and explain how you uh, bring that with today's India. But it is interesting how you draw the parallel out there. You know, one is the ethical, moral, but there's also this, there's a question, uh, you know, is Lord Rama, isn't he being smart? Yeah. That he's actually judged him well, partly because of Hanuman. Mm -hmm. huh? Hanuman has given him the inputs. This allows him to make a judgment about Vibhishan, which actually is not shared by those around him. Mm -hmm. You know, they are very suspicious of him. Yeah. Whereas he realizes the value mm -hmm. of what it means to have someone like this on his side. Hmm. And also for the general good of the people. You keep doing, saying that, that it's not just um, being moralistic in, in isolation, that one sees uh, the stories from Ramayana. Everything is associated with the good of the people yes. in mind. And I like how you bring the parallels. Well, uh, in today's political hmm. parlance, I would say delivery on the ground. <laughs> huh? So, you know, if if you are doing something and that doing something means effective delivery for the population, you know, tell me what can be nobler than delivering uh, good to people and changing their lives for the better. I have to ask you about the title. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Why Bharat Matters. Bharat and India interchangeable and you come to the title of the book in the very last chapter. Yeah. So uh, usually, again, like I said, that many presumptions that one has while picking up a book written by a minister, uh, would you overturn many of that in this book. And one is that you tell us only in the last chapter why Bharat matters. Uh, well, again, you know, I want people to read the other 10 <laughs> chapters before getting there. But uh, look, uh, I, you know, there's a very active debate right now. Uh, I, I think in many ways, uh, uh, obviously, people use that debate for their own uh, narrow purposes. The fact is, to me, uh, the term Bharat has a certain, uh, not just a cultural, civilizational connotation, but also one of a certain confidence and identity and, uh, you know, and on what terms you, how you perceive yourself and because that is my business, what are the terms you are offering to the world. So, I, I don't, uh, you know, this is, this is not to me something which is a narrow political uh, debate or I would even say in that sense a historical cultural debate. Mm -hmm. It is a mindset uh, and the, the point I make is that if we are actually preparing uh, seriously for the Amrit Kal, next 25 years, if we are talking of a Viksit Bharat, a developed Bharat, that can only happen if you are an Atma Nirbhar Bharat. In 2024, we complete 10 years uh, of Prime Minister Modi uh, being in office. Uh, you've been Ambassador, Foreign Secretary, EAM uh, during this tenure. What have been the, where do you see the pivot happen in Indian foreign policy and 
what are the what were the challenges when you took over as foreign secretary as EM? Uh, what are the goals and uh, that were given to you uh, mm -hmm. when you took? Uh, well, uh, again, I have tried to uh, bring that out in the book, uh, in an account of what uh, uh, I have put as a decade of transformation. But you've hmm? not talked about it personally. That's what it's not a memoir. That's no, what it's I'm not a memoir. Yeah, it's, so. it's not a memoir. I mean, I, I, you can't write a memoir when you are still holding a job. <laughs> you know. Hmm. Uh, so uh, the I have tried. You know, I've tried to be very objective about it. Hmm. You know, in a in a way, I'm a participant, but I'm also a person uh, trying to uh, deliberately take myself out and look at it. Uh, very Several very, prisms going uh, on. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say it was not so much that there was a turning point. I mean, unless and and you can call 2014 as a turning point. Once you know, uh, Modi comes in in 2014, uh, and uh, uh, really weighs the foreign policy which now he's, he's taken charge of. Uh, that's, that's essentially the chapter which I described where uh, you can see, you know, he, he feels the need for a new construct. That one where the neighborhood, uh, very generous uh, non-reciprocal policy towards the neighborhood which brings the neighborhood in closer. To the fact that we have uh, an extended zone. The mandalas that. that you talk yes, about. Yes, yes. The, you know, the uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Indian Ocean, uh, the Gulf, uh, Central Asia. Now, we had done, made some progress definitely in Southeast Asia. But if you look, for example, at the Gulf, hmm. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, this is a region so near us, so many Indians living there, so much oil imported from there, yet politically very, very neglected. I mean, a country like UAE, for example, had not had a prime ministerial visit from before Modi went there from the time of Indira Gandhi. Uh, so, and then you will look at the Indian Ocean. You know, again, we were dealing with it like, you know, this piecemeal. island, that island. Mm. Yes, piecemeal. I mean, there wasn't a single mm. uh, integrated uh, construct. And uh, again, in the case of uh, Central Asia, that intensity of, of connection was not there. Then the ability really to engage uh, multiple uh, power, the major powers engage not in the sense of oh keep us out of your problems because that's a kind of like I don't want to get caught mm. in the big debates of the day that's not what we are saying we are saying yes we have stakes in the big debates of the day I will take my call but I there's no exclusivity in any of my relationships I reserve the right to deal with each one of you as per my national interest and uh, also uh, preparing for a larger uh, footprint, hmm. you know, global footprint, then the entire approach to the diaspora has under undergone a change. Absolutely. Yeah. From 2014 yeah. onwards, yeah. Yeah. they were suddenly in center focus right. and uh, they remained so because initially it seemed as if there were many articles which came up and articles which said that this is just the start, uh, you know, in uh, grip of the foreign policy, he's going to ignore uh, the the diaspora and get on with the leaders, but that's not happened. Well, I think as has been the case for the last 10 years, a lot of people who've been writing about it really do have no idea what is happening. What uh, to expect, at least nobody knows. Uh, yes. So, so maybe by writing this book, I may be doing everybody a service, at least. By demystifying give, you know, it. Saying, okay, here is a logic, here is a narrative. Yeah. Uh, why, you know, why don't, I'm sure those who are open-minded enough to want to learn, uh, would would probably uh, find some uh, benefit, but uh, the uh, the other part is also if you look at the big global issues of the day, mm. you know, that uh, say for example climate change, you know, we were perceived as one of the countries holding back. Uh, today, actually, yeah. whether it is uh, International Solar Alliance, the Disaster Resilient Coalition, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, having been uh, with Prime Minister Modi in Paris, in Glasgow, recently in uh, Dubai. Uh, we've actually sort of taken the lead when it comes to the COP uh, meetings and... Uh, so, uh, I, I will read out a couple of quotes uh, from the book. Uh, in, in one of them, you say diplomacy is about chemistry and credibility. Uh, and you keep referring to that in the uh, book several times about how this chemistry, especially with uh, the Prime Minister and world leaders, how it's impactful mm -hmm. uh, on 
on delivering on foreign policy. Could you tell me a little bit about how these 10 years have mattered as far as this chemistry and credibility is concerned? You know, uh, I mean, look, uh, it's not that difficult to appreciate. I mean, le let's for a moment not think of the leaders, okay? If two people have not met each other, have not spoken to each other, have not spent time with each other, how could they possibly relate to each other? Hmm. I mean, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? And yet, when you have, you know, when we say, okay, India is growing. I mean, surely if India is growing, our interests are growing, that means we need to be much more active and much more engaging and there must be that kind of connect because at hmm. the end of the day, you know, leaders do, you know, a large part of policy making is derived from the judgment that a system, especially the system's leader makes. Hmm. You know. Now, if the, if I have not even spoken to you, you, you know, how am I going to influence your judgment? So, if you, if you see the last decade, uh, to me, one great, uh, I would say, advantage, uh, a tailwind I've had as Foreign Secretary and now as EF, is the fact that in many countries, uh, when you go there, the fact that the President or the Prime Minister, they know Prime Minister Modi, they admire him, they've spoken to him, they've discussed something, they've done something, this counts an enormous amount. And the hugs and the Twitter engagement, the uh, ex-engagement now, uh, or social media, the Prime Minister embraced social media right away and then every meeting that he's had with heads of state and government, he tweets about it, then those people, uh, the heads of government there tweet about it. So this is, uh, social media has played a very large role yes. in this chemistry and credibility business. You know, uh, yes it has. Uh, I think also to some extent they look, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there was that example which was captured by the cameras. Uh, where, where President Biden is telling Prime Minister Modi, saying, you know, whatever, you have a 70-something percent uh, approval rate, so how, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think other politicians, uh, you know, like in any competi competitive uh, profession, they look to see, okay, what does the, how is the peer faring? Okay? Uh, so, uh, for them, the fact that, you know, uh, uh, a Prime Minister uh, is doing well in the country. The, it could, mm. the doing well could be an election result. Doing well could be 7.7 .7 growth rate. Doing well could be uh, handling COVID. Doing well could be um, uh, deploying 5G. So they make these judgments. But at the Why uh, didn't, if if President Biden wanted this kind of rating, he could have come for the Republic Day parade. He could have got a Namaste Biden. Like Namaste you Trump? Know, you know, I, I think that was a different issue because we got, you know, it was tied to the quad also. And, mm. and we couldn't get a landing zone uh, there. Explain uh, what is landing zone to layman? No, meaning we, we couldn't get everything agreed with everybody. Mm. So, uh, so, therefore it didn't work. Okay, um, another quote which I, ha I found interesting was a nationalist outlook will naturally produce a nationalist democracy. Now, is it something that, and, and you also say that it's something that the world will need get used to. Now, this is something that many people have written about, uh, those who have seen Indian foreign policy evolve, that there is a, a kind of a muscular foreign policy now. It's a nationalist foreign I policy. I confident, domestic. not muscular. Okay, confident, no, no. Uh, your choice yeah. of word. Um, some say, like you would say confident, some would say it's bombastic at times even because of this, uh, the domestic policy is so nationalistic, it's reflecting on the international uh, interactions that the Prime Minister, that the Foreign Minister and everybody else has. Have we made more friends? Have we become a Vishwamitra or are we imposing our view on, on the various mandalas that you talked about, which is our neighborhood and then the East Asia area? No, I, I look, I don't think we are imposing our view because at the end of the day in foreign relations, beyond a point, you can't impose your view unless, you know, you are such a big power with such a yeah. huge margin of uh, strength uh, that you can and uh, uh, that is not the case. Uh, I would certainly say today, uh, that if you look at the 200 odd countries, okay, uh, if you say where is India today in their consciousness, in their awareness, 
I would say in the last 10 years, we are very much hmm. deeper and stronger uh, in that regard. If you say, do, how many of them feel something has happened in India which is relevant to them? I would again say the answer is yes, those numbers have, have grown. We are seen as more relevant, we are more visible. Uh, we are seen as influencing many more outcomes. So, one, I mean, if you look at it today, many more leaders want to come to India. I mean, one of my big uh, challenges as a foreign minister is really uh, to, uh, to uh, explain why Prime Minister cannot visit every country in the world every year, because mm. everybody wa apparently wants him to come. I'm going to yeah. go into the trouble areas. So, uh, when you talked about, the, when we talk about... No, this is not a trouble area. This is, when you have high demand, I mean, it's in a way a welcome problem. You have many uh, wanting uh, to come here. And many wanting to come, many of them who I... want him to go out. So, uh, I would certainly say today, you know, look, when we say Vishwamitra, just look, I, I give you the example. Vishwamitra of, feels nice. Vishwaguru no, 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 seems threatening no, to no, many. No, no. I've used the word Vishwamitra and uh, to me, if you want one example of that, it's the G20, that at the G20, look, go back and look at it, 24 hours, not even 12 hours before the G20 uh, declaration was finalized, there were people publicly predicting that we will fail. Okay, now I know some part of it was politically driven, put that aside. Hmm. But the general expectation was, you know, relations today are so polarized on the Ukraine issue, if uh, the uh, concerns of the global south have become so strong and yet, uh, you know, being contested in a way or not being recognized uh, duly by others. So there was a north-south divide, there was a east-west polarization, different countries were pulling in different directions and yet the fact was eventually we got everybody to come to the table. And, and I accept, when they all came to the table, they deserve credit. Hmm. But finally, the truth is, they came to the table because everybody ultimately had a relationship with India. Hmm. The other 19 countries said, yes, this, this matters for India. This is something which is right. So let if, because the fact is everybody made a compromise. That's how it happened. Yeah. You know? So, but that uh, happened and then uh, suddenly we saw ties with Canada plummet. It happened no, literally that, within that, weeks. No, no, but that. What, uh, what went wrong that, there? And that, uh, that is, I think, un, I mean, I, I it honestly happened do not see. during the summit. Uh, look, I do not see a correlation there, no? I mean, uh, getting everybody around on a G20 has nothing to do with the Khalistani issue in, in Canada. I mean, the Khalistani issue is not a new issue. The Khalistani issue has existed for decades. Why do you think that it, is, uh, it has become so uh, such a thorn in the flesh for India-Canada relations? And why do you think Prime Minister Trudeau, for a handful of Khalistanis, has put relationship with India on the rocks? Uh, look, I, I am. I can explain my government, my prime minister, and my book. But you're also an I, academic. I, I, you're also a diplomat. I, I, I do not. I. It's not for me to speculate uh, on other prime ministers. But I will tell you the the issue at heart. The issue at heart is the fact that in Canadian politics, uh, these Khalistani forces have been given a lot of space and have been allowed to indulge in activities which uh, I, I think are damaging to the relationship, clearly uh, not in India's interest, but I would argue not in Canada's interest either. But unfortunately, that is the state of their politics. Hmm. How, do, how do you see the allegations that Canada makes on India with regard to uh, deaths which have taken place, unexplained deaths which they call and the investigations they are doing and compare it with what the Americans and how they, they uh, are reacting. Uh, Smita, I have spoken about this before. Uh, mm. It is not obviously subject relating to my book mm. and we are not here to do a press conference. Right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I've been quite, quite clear on this that if somebody gives us something to investigate, we'll look at it. Right. Um, I will move on to, in, in your book you talk... Uh, yes, let's stay with the book. <laughs> uh, in the book, uh, you, you talk about legacy building also and about how uh, everything that has happened in the Modi era has worked towards a goal. In 2024, um, will India and China bury the hatchet? Because there is a, in one part you talk about uh, relationship with uh, France and how it has gone forward. You talk about uh, relationship with Japan. These two stand out clearly in the Modi era having uh, taken an upward trajectory. 
The two which don't take an upward trajectory, one is China uh, and the other one is of course Pakistan. Pakistan barely makes any mention in your book, but mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. So will, it, will steps be taken in 2024 uh, to bury the hatchet? See, I cannot answer that because obviously, uh, as they say, it takes two hands to clap. But I pose the issue and I pose the issue in this manner. That if you look at the last uh, 75 plus years uh, of our foreign policy, uh, we've had a strain of realism about China and we have had a strain of, uh, I can say you can call it idealism, romanticism, non-realism non you can say. And it begins right from, from in a sense from day one, I mean where there is a very sharp difference of opinion how to respond to China between Nehru and Sardar Patel. I'm, I'm giving a certain uh, attitude here. So I would say uh, the Modi government and has been very much more in conformity with the strain of realism which originated from Sardar Patel. And you mentioned the, uh, the romanticism of the Nehruvian era. Yes, yes. Now, and then you talk about no, the and, and I've given some yeah. examples. I mean, where, where, you know, even when it came, for example, uh, to uh, the UN, hmm. uh, UN Security Council seat. Now, again, it's not my case that we should have necessarily taken the seat. It's a, it's a, that's a different debate. But to say that, you know, we should first let China, you know, China's interests should come first. You know, that's, that's a very, uh, it's a very uh, peculiar statement to make. And you, you know? also write that there was no reciprocity in the years after Absolutely. that from China. Yeah, no, so there is a judgment here. There is first a judgment about what we... All, of, all right, that of course you've seen External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar candidly interacting with uh, ANI's Smita Prak. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.